This morning, I was going to go on with the offering of Jesus' blood as part of the communion, but I just felt in my heart that we should just linger a little bit more on the body of Jesus. And for this reason, I, I just sense in my heart that there may be some here that are still wondering about their salvation, and they don't fully know Am I saved? Am I going to heaven? Have I committed too many sins? Have I blown it one too many times? And now God has turned his back on me. And I think we really need to be fully assured of God's love for us. The gospel is very, very simple. And it's just this simple. If you come to God with an honest heart and say, Father, I am a sinner I have sinned, please forgive me. Like I've said before, it is amazing what God can do with an honest heart. That, that's all he asks, is an honest heart. If you come to the light, as he is in the light, holding back nothing, just tell him your heart, tell him how, how uh, sinful you've been, be honest with him. You have the promise, you have the guarantee that he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In fact, 1 John says he is faithful and just. Now think about that for a moment and get that through your head. It would be legally unjust for God not to forgive you. Now we don't have to take him to court and hold him to that to the letter of that scripture saying you've got to forgive me. And we don't have to do that because he, he he's anxious. He's more than eager to forgive you. He wants to love you and to embrace you. But I just wanted to go through some of these points again, maybe a little slower, maybe a little simpler. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, where Jesus instituted this sacrament we call communion in the Last Supper. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. And remember the eating, uh, we went through a little bit of time describing the ingestion and then the digestion. And he's saying that this salvation that you partake of, receive it into your heart by faith. It's, it's just that simple. There's nothing hard about it. There's nothing you have to do. You just simply say, Father, I need your forgiveness. I need your salvation. I receive your salvation. And then once you ingest it, that's when the digestion starts to where you really begin to live off of that salvation. And the joy that you have is because of the hope of your salvation. And, and you receive the, the spiritual nutrients and energy that comes from a faith that rests in Jesus Christ. And so you, you ingest, you digest, you take the truth of it into your heart and embrace it. And then it says that he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. And so that part in verse 27, I don't think we'll get to that uh, this morning. Drink of it, all of you, because he goes on to say here, for this is the blood of the what? the covenant, and I'm hoping to really hammer on that next week in the sense that this is the blood of the covenant, this is the blood of the contract, this is the blood of my relationship with you. In other words, this is what I am promising you. I am promising to forgive you. I, you know, the more and more I've meditated and thought on things, I really do believe in eternal security. I believe that you are eternally secure if you are sorry for your sins and you ask him for forgiveness and salvation. If you are going through your life self-willed, stubborn, rebellious, insisting on staying in the control of your life, you're going to hell. There's just no other way to say it. I don't care how many sinners' prayers you've prayed and how long you've gone to church or but if you are honest and just say, Father, I need you. I'm lost without you. Miracles he can do with an honest heart. And he promises, there's a covenant in place. He promises to forgive you. It's something that you can rest assured of. 
And so let's get into this a little bit. The offering of Jesus' body. I put there in your notes, by becoming our sin bearer, Jesus was made to be sin with our sin born in his body. There's a wonderful illustration of this. God loves to use imagery and parables, and he likes to paint pictures in our mind. And there's a wonderful uh, part of the, of the Levitical rituals that they would do. We see it here in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. You've probably read it before. Remember the scapegoat? To celebrate, to remember, to uh, honor the forgiveness of God and the covenant that he had made with them to forgive their sins. They went through this once a year, and remember there were two goats. One goat died on the altar, and then one goat was let out into the wilderness. And I want to show you what that scapegoat was for in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put those sins on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. And the goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Now when you read that, you know, it's kind of easy to think, oh good, he's letting the goat free, and the goat can can uh, have a carefree life from here on out, and the goat has his freedom. Isn't that good? That's not what he's talking about here. What it's talking about here, see where it says, the goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. And that word remote area means a place of separation. And then he shall let the goat go free into the wilderness, which means a desert. It's a sterile country, meaning nothing grows there. So when he was letting this goat go free into the wilderness, that was a death sentence on the goat. It wouldn't be very long before that goat would die and probably die a miserable death of salvation, of being attacked by wild animals, whatever. But the fact of the matter is Jesus is called our sin bearer. And this goat was a symbol, a type of what Jesus did for you. And getting back to the verse that we started on, in Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I don't know, I may have put it in your notes, I can't remember if I did or not, but when it says there that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, it, it's not like the Lord laid him down to sleep. That word laid is actually a violent term. It means to, uh, it means to strike violently. And so it's your sins, every sin of every human was violently struck upon Jesus there in his flesh on the cross. Now why is that important? Well, in 1 Peter, we see here, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So just like Aaron would confess over the goat the sins of the people, and those sins are now transferred off of the people onto the goat, and then the goat was set off into the wilderness, the land of, of, that can't be inhabited, the sterile land that's dead. So your sins were placed upon Jesus on the cross, every one of them. That lustful thought you had this past week, Jesus bore that. That lie you told, Jesus bore that in his body. And when your sin passed onto Jesus, the wonderful miracle is that it left you. It's no longer on your account. You are no longer guilty. We see here in Psalms 103, verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far does he what? Remove our transgressions from us. And so the whole miracle of the cross is that our sins passed upon Jesus. And just like that scapegoat was sent into the wilderness to die, Jesus was there on the cross to die in our place. But now that the sins have been transferred on to him, you are free. There's not even one sin on your record, on your account. It's too good to be true, isn't it? I mean, when we think of our life, thank God for the, for the growth we've experienced and thank God for the deliverance from sin that we've experienced. But when we think of ourselves, it's too good to be true that I could stand before a holy God sinless. But in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you and I stand before God this morning sinless in a judicial sense. We're still going through sanctification and purification. But before the throne of God, before the authority of his throne, we appear before him sinless with not even one sin on our account. That's a miracle. And you're free to embrace your heavenly father. By doing so, Hebrews says that he removed all obstruction. Before, that very sin was the thing that prevented you from knowing God and having a relationship with God. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, you have confidence to enter into your relationship with God. You have confidence to pray. You have confidence to depend upon him. You have confidence that he will look after you and save you and help you and minister to you. You don't have to be ashamed going before your heavenly father because everything that obstructed you from him has now been removed. And you can go to him with confidence. Do you have confidence in the love of your father this morning? Do you know that he loves you? Last Thursday night, we talked about hearing the voice of God. That's one of the main things God wants to speak to you. I love you. And it won't make any difference when you hear it from my mouth, but it makes a world of difference when you hear it from his mouth. And it sinks real deep into your soul, and you think, he really does love me. That's where conviction is built. That voice of the Lord is your, in your heart is what you're willing to die for and sacrifice all for. It's your anchor. It's your refuge. So he says we can have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, which is referring to the veil. And remember the veil? I forget the, uh, I forget the statistics of the veil, but this veil, uh, I can't remember. It was, it was really, really thick. It's like three inches thick of tapestry. And, uh, and it, it ripped, it rent from top to bottom. Go home after church and try to tear a blanket in half and see if you can do it. It'd be something like that. But such a miracle. Remember, in the temple, the veil was rent from top to bottom, symbolizing access to God is now open. The sins which kept you from your God have been removed mercifully, miraculously by Jesus on the cross. Every one. Jesus didn't leave one sin behind. And you can now stand before him sinless. It's a wonderful miracle. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, and because your sins passed upon him in his death on the cross, he now presents you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Let those words sink in. Satan is a most vicious accuser, and he does his job very well. And he will speak to you and lie to you, and he will speak through others to you, telling you that you are not worthy, 
that you are an ugly sinner, that God could never love you. You'll never be good enough to get into heaven. You got to come to Colossians chapter 1, verse 22 and realize, I have been reconciled to Father in the body of his flesh. My sin passed upon Jesus. Therefore, there's not even one sin left on my account. And I stand before Father right now, holy and blameless and above reproach. Not necessarily in my character or in my behavior, because we're still working some of those things out between me and the Lord. But as a matter of judicial fact, it is a judicial fact. I stand before the throne of God this morning, holy and blameless and above reproach, because Jesus was my scapegoat, and he bore my sins away as far as the east is from the west, and they will never again return to my account. That's, the, that's one of the greatest miracles of the cross. Now notice this, because I, I love the way this Paul worded this here. He has now reconciled us in the body of his flesh to present us holy and blameless and above reproach. If indeed you continue in the, what? In the faith. And so when you arrive on heaven's shores one day, it's going to have nothing to do with what you've done or how good your behavior has become. When you arrive on heaven's shores one day, it's going to be all because of that one moment in eternity when Jesus bore all of your sins away, removing them from you. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. Don't ever make the tragic mistake of thinking that you've started in the spirit, but now you have to finish it in the flesh that you were saved and born again by faith, but now you have to earn God's favor and try to be good enough to get into heaven. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. Keep Jesus on the cross forever before your eyes. Keep that scapegoat forever in your heart and thank him daily for taking your sins away. And don't shift from that hope because that's what gets you into heaven. That's what grants you the favor of God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. He made him to be sin with your sin, with my sin. He bore my sin in his body so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. Like I was saying last week, that's why when we arrive on heaven's shores one day, when we die, we're not going to die sinless. Hopefully we've made great strides in our growth and in the cleansing of our character. But when we die, we're still going to be riddled with faults and sins and mistakes and failures that we make. But when you stand before Father, He sees none of that. Because all of that was removed by Jesus on the cross. And now we stand before him, the righteousness of God. And he's going to look down at you and he's going to say, perfect. You are perfect. Washed by the blood of Jesus. Your sins have been removed. And that has got to be the anchor of your soul. That's got to be the bedrock of your conviction. Don't ever be moved off of that into a works mentality of now I've got to prove myself to God or I've got to earn my salvation or I've got to be good enough to go to heaven. Trash all of that out of your mind. That's wrong. That's from the accuser of the brethren. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my righteousness. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Yes, we are still being sanctified. And until the day that we leave this flesh behind, the process of cleansing and sanctification will be there. So we're still being sanctified here in this time and space world that we are in. But in the heavenly, by one single offering, he has perfected us. God sees us whole. God sees us perfect. God sees us sinless. 
Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because Jesus bore our sin away. And now we stand in the righteousness of God by a single offering He has perfected for all time. You're good. Your eternity is secure. Your salvation is secure for all time because of what Jesus did on the cross as long as you don't shift from that hope of the gospel. So we're still being sanctified here now. But don't mistake that sanctification as something that I have to do to earn my way to heaven. Always fall back on the bedrock of what Jesus did on the cross. And remember, we talked about the penitent thief last week. The penitent thief never prayed the sinner's prayer, never went to Sunday school. Maybe he went to synagogue, who knows? We don't know much about his history. Never followed Jesus, was never baptized by John the Baptist from all that we can tell. He died on that cross guilty as sin, takes up and defends Jesus, says, Lord, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said what? Today. Today you shall be with me in paradise. Well, for all those people that say that, you know, when we, when we uh, die, we just go into nothingness and we cease to be like an animal, And for all of those people who say that there's soul sleep and we're going to go into some sort of a comatose state for who knows how long, that's all false. That's all a lie. The moment that you breathe your last breath, you'll be with Jesus in heaven. And that's a wonderful thought to think on. Sometimes we get a little bit bit anxious about death. You know, have you ever gotten anxious about death? I get anxious about death. A lot of times we're more anxious about how we're going to die rather than the death itself. But even death itself, you know, we've never done it before, right? I remember the last week of Janet Scott's life when she was dying. And and uh, that's an awkward situation, isn't it? When you're, you know, someone just has hours or a few days left and you can almost start to feel guilty. Well, gee, I'm just sitting around waiting for them to die. But it, there's nothing to feel guilty about. It's, it's just an awkward moment in our life. And we're all a little anxious about death because we've never done it before, right? I mean, if we were Lazarus and we had already done it, we would have thought, ha, no big deal. We can do this. I did it once before. But when you, the first time you do something you've never done before, you know, it's a little awkward, a little nervous. And so uh, Janet would say, she, she'd say, I've got to die and get out of here so that you guys can get on with your life. And that was so true to her nature. She was always thinking of others around her, right? And then from there, she'd say something like, I don't know how to die. How do I die? And again, it's something that you've never done before. But death is going to be, death for the Christian, for the believer, is going to be so miraculous, so wonderful. I mean, it's going to, we can't even comprehend. Do you realize that every day we are conflicted souls? We have Jesus living in our heart. We want to do what's right. We want to serve and please him. And then we've got this rebellious flesh that fights us every step of the way. I don't think we know how vexed and conflicted we are. We've just kind of gotten used to it. But you know, when you get to heaven, all of that's going to be gone. This flesh is going to be gone. No more pain, no more suffering, no more temptation. All of this confliction of fighting with my flesh and the world is instantly going to be gone. You're suddenly going to be in perfect harmony with Jesus, with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and all of heaven. You're going to be perfectly synchronized with that realm now, and all of that conflict inside and the inner turmoil will be gone. You'll be more alive than you've ever been before. You won't be tired, no worry, no fear. All of the hurts and the abuses and the wounds that we've carried and the scars that we've carried through this life, instantly gone. (laughs) 
What a wonderful place. And Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. No lag. No soul sleep. No ambiguity. The moment I draw my last breath, I'm there before Jesus. And so I just wanted to review. We don't have a whole lot from the scriptures, a lot of detail about what it's like to pass into our next life, either by rapture or by death. You know, there's nowhere where there's a description of, well, it's kind of like you, you go down this big circular hallway or this big cone, and you're going down this cone to this light. And, and I'm not discrediting any of that. I'm just saying it's not there in the scriptures. Doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. So we don't have that detail, but there are some things that we do know. Number one, when you stand before your heavenly father one day, for the first time face to face, you will stand perfect and complete in the righteousness of God because your sins have been borne away. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear because fear has torment. And I'm afraid of God. And like Adam and Eve, I, I hide myself in the shrubs because I don't want to be seen and exposed because I know how ugly and sinful I am. There's none of that when you go to heaven. Perfect love casts out all fear. It doesn't say your perfect behavior casts out all fear. It doesn't say your entitlement casts out all fear because you're entitled to nothing. It doesn't say you're, you are, you know, you're, you are the most improved. What was that thing in high school? They had the, anyway, the most improved or something award or something like that. You know, you, you didn't win the heavenly most improved award. It's nothing like that. It, it, you don't have anything to do with casting out the fear of judgment. It's his love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Because I know Jesus loves me and he's promised to forgive me and to wash me from my sins, his perfect love casts out all fear. I have nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to be afraid of going and standing before his throne face to face. All the fear has been cast out. Jesus has removed my sins, not even one remaining behind. And I stand perfect and complete in my Father's presence. What the process of sanctification has not yet accomplished, the forgiveness of justification will cover, like we said last week. As long as we're here on this earth, we are called to be holy. We are called to be obedient. We are called to not faint and grow weary of the sanctification process, the cleansing process of trials, we are to endure to the end. But when we get there, it's all about what Jesus did on the cross. That's why we're ushered into heaven. So don't ever receive the lie that I've fallen behind spiritually and I'm not where I'm supposed to be and somehow I've got to work extra hard to try to catch up and just concentrate on knowing God for today and he will get you where you need to be. Just concentrate on surrendering your will, enjoying his fellowship, worshiping him for who he is, being honest with him, confessing your sins, and then doing your best to serve him with all of your heart. He'll get you where you need to be. The one who started the work is the one who will perform the work. Sanctification is his business, not yours. And then when you stand before him, the Bible is clear that we will be rewarded for our works that were done by him. You know, when you were in the middle of an argument or some disagreement with someone and it made you so mad and your flesh just reacted and you wanted to say a few choice words or throw a few well-aimed punches or whatever, and then suddenly when you were confronted with that person again, such a peace and such a love and such a forgiveness came over you. And instead of being mad at them, you actually felt sympathy for them. 
and you treated them with kindness, not the way that your anger wanted you to treat them, but you treated them considerately with kindness and gentleness. And you think, wow, where did that come from? That wasn't me. Who's taken over my body? It was the Holy Spirit, wasn't it? And when you have those times in your life where Jesus really does live through you, you're going to be rewarded for those times. Why I should be rewarded for something I didn't do, Jesus did it in me, I don't know, but I'll take the reward, right? So you'll be rewarded for those things, but our works done in the flesh, the Bible says, will be burned up in the judgment of that moment. So we're living day by day, striving to be cleansed by the Lord, striving to be sanctified by the Lord. But like we said, the day you arrive on heaven's doorstep, there's still going to be a lot of crud in us. There's still going to be things that we do wrong, think wrong, say wrong. And that stuff will be judged. But even that is not a judgment you have to be afraid of. Because watch what it says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. And when he says the day there, it, you can replace that with judgment. The judgment, just being in his presence, being in the glory of his majesty, will disclose everything in your life that's right or wrong. The right will be rewarded, and this is what happens to the wrong. It will be revealed by fire. The fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Well, the, the imagery that Paul is creating here is very obvious. What would not be destroyed in fire? the precious stones, the silver, and the gold. What would burn up in the fire? The wood and the hay and the straw. One are deeds done in righteousness because of Jesus Christ in you. The other are deeds that done that are carnal of the flesh. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be what? <coughs> Saved, but as through fire. Even this judgment is nothing to be afraid of. You know the confliction that you feel every day? Flesh against spirit, sin against righteousness, right against wrong, and it's all in this one body, and we are so conflicted, and at times it torments us. You're going to be so glad to see that stuff burn away. That's freedom, man. That's liberty. I'm getting rid of all of the baggage that haunted me down on earth. And I'm going to be purified, made innocent in Father's presence. And everything that threatened to destroy me on earth is consumed and destroyed by the fire of his presence, never to haunt me again. Won't that be a glorious time? Well, that's what happens when we go and we stand before Father. Why? All because of what Jesus did on the cross when he took all of your sins and he bore them away as far as the east is from the west as our sin bearer as our scapegoat and he didn't even leave one sin behind now can you believe it can you receive it in faith this morning can you say i know i am saved i know i am born again i know as i stand before father Judicially, there's not even one sin on my account. I know I'm going to heaven. Do you have that confidence in your heart? Has his perfect love cast out all of the fear in your heart?